This video is sponsored by Aura. The macro version of that is, and I get this all the time, should I, uh, do I have what it takes to be a writer? Am I good enough at this? So, on May 12th, 2017, Neil Gaiman received a question from Tumblr user Ducks Wear Hats. The user wrote, I read that you've dealt with imposter syndrome in the past and I'm really struggling with that right now. I'm in a good place and my friends are going through a lot and I'm struggling to justify my success to myself when such amazing people are unhappy. I was wondering if you have any tips to feel less like this and maybe be kinder to myself but without hurting anyone around me. Have you ever felt similarly? Or perhaps you felt like the students who took part in a University of Cumbria study who said things such as, quote, Everyone else is cleverer than me. I knew I'd be the oldest one. Everyone else knew what they were doing. This study, conducted by Amanda Chapman, focused on imposter syndrome in mature students who were writing at the collegiate level. One student called Charlie expressed, I'm worried about the research, the writing, and the collating of thoughts, putting it together into a coherent essay. It takes me ages to draft a few paragraphs. It's exhausting. Each word has to be thought through. It's a good thing, but it's painstaking. It has to be perfect. I can't hand it in till it's perfect. Another student called Eleanor said, you're writing it and all the time it's, am I doing it right? I don't really know what I'm meant to be doing. A student called Francis described the difficulty in working with her lecturer. He's a different person to me. We speak a different language. Every time he says something, I have to translate it into my language. And when I reply to him, he has to translate it back. Whether you're in high school or college or just a person who likes to create things, chances are you've dealt with imposter syndrome. While definitions may vary, the Google definition is certainly adequate. The persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own efforts or skills. Now keep in mind, success is a relative term. Some of you watching this video might be very successful by financial or critical standards, others not so much. Whatever camp you fall into, I want you to consider this. If you have created something, that's a success. Whether you've written a story, poem, song, or even if you're simply in the process of writing, you should consider yourself successful for that. Still, despite the many successes we accrue in this lifetime as writers, imposter syndrome is pervasive. The Chapman study draws comparisons between imposter syndrome and feelings of fraudulence and a lack of confidence in one's ability. In an honors thesis from Portland State University, Carly Baer surveyed 52 members of the February Album Writing Month community. Of these participants, 88% of them had been writing songs for at least 10 years. Even still, 90.4% of participants experienced feelings of self-doubt when writing songs. Other widespread feelings included imposter syndrome, writer's block, fear of criticism, fear of failure, anxiety, and depression. When given the option to write in additional experiences, participants listed experiencing feelings of insignificance, unable to ever earn respect amongst others, and days when you feel you don't know how to write anymore, as well as insecurity, particularly related to my age and my skill level. So it seems like imposter syndrome never goes away. In writing, the question often manifests as, am I good enough to be a writer? Or even more simply, am I a good writer? Which brings us back to Neil Gaiman. But before we get into that, I'd like to read you a short poem I wrote. There's someone trying to reach me about my car's extended warranty. Who's that DMing for money? Who else but a long dead celebrity? An email with a fishy link and all these texts from numbers unlisted. More spam faster than I can blink. How did my data become so twisted? Fraud abounds. Where's the defender for my password, number, and autonym? In these times, we must remember. Aura has the best, cheapest solution. Be honest, are you not sick of all the spam calls you constantly receive? Like, look at this, this is an actual screenshot from my phone. Look at all these unknown numbers. That's where the sponsor of today's video, Aura, can help. Data brokers are buying and selling your information all the time. Aura identifies these data brokers and submits opt-out requests for you. Brokers are legally required to take down your info when you ask them to, but they make it impossible. Aura takes care of the hassle for you. I got started with Aura and within minutes the vault sent request after request to these sites I'd never even heard of before. Aura also protects you and your family from online threats in ways you can't even see. As soon as I signed up, Aura was able to scan the dark web for any of my information. And on top of it all, my account was so easy to set up. 
Once I put in my name, birthday, address, phone number, and SSN, the takedown requests came one after the other. With functionality such as parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more, you can manage your data easily from one place at an affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can get a two-week free trial by going to aura.com slash roughest drafts. That's aura.com slash roughest drafts for a two-week free trial. The link is in the description. Now, let's get back to Neil Gaiman's advice regarding imposter syndrome. You're probably familiar with Neil for his wide bibliography, including works like Coraline, The Sandman, Good Omens, American Gods, and many, many others. Or perhaps you recognize him from his 2010 appearance on Arthur. This is silly! I was quite enjoying it, actually. Neil Gaiman? What are you doing in my falafel? When Gaiman received this question from a fan about imposter syndrome, he first recommended Amy Cuddy's book, Presence, then shared the following anecdote. Some years ago, I was lucky enough to be invited to a gathering of great and good people, artists and scientists, writers and discoverers of things, and I felt that at any moment they would realize that I didn't qualify to be there, among these people who had really done things. On my second or third night there, I was standing at the back of the hall while a musical entertainment happened, and I started talking to a very nice, polite, elderly gentleman about several things, including our shared first name. And then, he pointed to the hall of people and said words to the effect of, I just look at all these people and I think, what the heck am I doing here? They've made amazing things, I just went where I was sent. And I said, yes, but you were the first man on the moon, I think that counts for something. And I felt a bit better, because if Neil Armstrong felt like an imposter, maybe everyone did. Maybe there weren't any grown-ups, only people who had worked hard and also got lucky and were slightly out of their depth, all of us doing the best job we could, which is all we can really hope for. This anecdote has been comforting to many in the same way the experience itself was comforting to Gaiman. In my mind, for example, knowing that people like Neil Armstrong and Neil Gaiman struggle with imposter syndrome tells me that perhaps my work isn't as bad as I think it is, or that my achievements aren't as small as I perceive them to be. More comforting than that, however, is just knowing that the human experience is not that different from person to person. No matter what a person loves doing, they've probably struggled with feelings of inadequacy just as much as you have. No matter what level of success we achieve, we must remember this all-too-human truth, and retain that empathy no matter what. Of course, as important as it is to remember that everyone struggles with imposter syndrome, that might not always be what we need to cure our feelings of inadequacy. So what do we do when faced with crippling self-doubt? Well, I certainly don't have all the answers, but let me share with you some findings and advice from people who are much smarter than I am. If you're struggling with imposter syndrome or self-doubt, the first thing you need to do is keep writing. I know that's easier said than done and it may seem counterintuitive, but the only way imposter syndrome wins is if it keeps you from doing what you love. There's a popular quote attributed to Leonardo da Vinci that says, Art is never finished, only abandoned. Sometimes art needs to be abandoned, but only in pursuit of another project. If you choose to abandon a piece of writing, just make sure it isn't your last. When you write, you probably do question the quality of your work, but at the same time, you still love to create something, don't you? In Carly Bear's thesis survey, after sharing the negative feelings many songwriters experienced, she also shared the positive feelings that came with creation. These sentiments included satisfaction, surprise, validation, and enthusiasm or excitement, which 100% of the respondents experienced in their craft. One thing that often keeps a writer down is the pursuit of perfection. It's understandable, we all want to create something perfect, but the fact of the matter is perfection doesn't exist. As Bear put it, Perfection is a mirage, a nebulous idea with arbitrary definitions that change depending on a variety of factors. By striving for an ephemeral sense of perfection, we tend to get bogged down by all the things a work is not, instead of building upon what it is. Bayer is absolutely correct. Trying to force brilliance will only paralyze you. Sometimes inspiration hits us hard, and we're able to write like mad. The ink flows freely, our fingertips pounce unceasingly across the keyboard, and the ideas are unchained and innumerable. But what happens when that moment is over? You can't write only when inspiration hits. 
Once you have no more inspiration, you'll find yourself unable to write. You must learn to write, whether you feel like writing or not. I promise, once you start writing, you will feel like writing. The hardest part is starting. Those moments of inspiration feel like religious experiences full of electricity. When the electricity fades, what do you do? Well, trust your previous religious experience and take a leap of faith. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep going whether the electricity is there or not. Before you know it, you'll be where you need to be. So, if you can't force brilliance, what do you do instead of striving for perfection? In his book, Atomic Habits, James Clear shared the following anecdote. On the first day of class, Jerry Olsman, a professor at the University of Florida, divided his film photography students into two groups. Everyone on the left side of the classroom, he explained, would be in the quantity group. They would be graded solely on the amount of work they produced. Meanwhile, everyone on the right side of the room would be in the quality group. They would be graded only on the excellence of their work. They would only need to produce one photo during the semester, but to get an A, it had to be a nearly perfect image. At the end of the term, he was surprised to find that all the best photos were produced by the quantity group. During the semester, these students were busy taking photos, experimenting with composition and lighting, testing out various methods in the darkroom, and learning from their mistakes. In the process of creating hundreds of photos, they honed their skills. It might sound crazy, but you want to strive for quantity over quality, at least to start with. Clear also wrote the following. If you want to write a best-selling book, then you could spend 10 years trying to write one perfect book, or you could write one book each year, learn from your mistakes, and trust that your books will get better each time. That's one method at least. The point is, take less interest in the product and more in the production. Write. Don't worry about making it good, that can come later. Just write. As a side effect of just writing, you will become a better writer. The best thing you've ever written is what you're working on right now. You can't be feeling that fire all the time, otherwise you'd burn yourself out. From time to time, you just have to stop and stare into the abyss, and you'll find that it stares back. Ernest Hemingway is credited as saying, the most essential gift for a good writer is a built-in shockproof crap detector. This is the writer's radar, and all great writers have had it. Of course, he didn't say crap. On the one hand, Hemingway is right. As a writer, it's invaluable to know the good from the bad. But that crap detector can be a double-edged sword. While you must know the good from the bad, your crap detector is going to try to tell you that everything you write is bad. And on a first draft, a lot of it probably is bad. You'll have to level with that. So what do you do? Well, you'll need to write at a time and place where your crap detector will be turned off. My writing professor suggested to all his students that they wake up at 4 a.m. and write two double-spaced pages to begin each day. His reasoning was a student would be far too tired at 4 in the morning for their crap detector to work if it was even turned on at all. Just agree to take what comes to you. Oftentimes, when you take what comes, things turn out much better than what you could have forced yourself to think of. The best lines are the ones you don't force, the ones that come by accident. And why would you want to make something perfect anyway? Perfection is the difference between a living deer and a deer mounted on the wall. Which one would you rather observe up close? When asked by students if they had what it takes to be a writer, UCLA's Professor Richard Walter said, And my answer is, I don't know. Uh, that's, not for, that's not for me to say. That's for, for uh, you know, should I continue to do this? Actually, I, my answer to that usually is no. Uh, don't continue to do this. Why not? Because you had to ask me whether or not you should do it. Uh, if you need to ask somebody about whether or not you should be a writer, then you should not be a writer. You should be a writer because you can't help yourself. There's nothing else you can do. You just can't stop yourself. You, gotta, you, you have to write. Not because it's fun, but it, because you have to do it, just like you have to breathe, you know. Remember something. If you write, then you are a writer. You might not be a published writer or a famous writer, but you are a writer nonetheless. I can say this with certainty. Whether or not I get the opportunity to publish, I will never stop writing. And I hope that's the same for you. Whether or not people think my writing is any good won't affect my need to write. All that matters is that I keep going. 
As difficult as it might be, if you're confronted with imposter syndrome, the first thing you must do is keep writing. After that, then what? One thing several imposter syndrome studies agree upon is the need for collaboration. Again, this probably seems counterintuitive. If imposter syndrome is characterized by feeling inadequate next to peers, how could one then turn to those peers for insight or review? But remember what Gaiman said, everyone is dealing with imposter syndrome. Sure, there are jerks out there, but people are surprisingly fairer than you think, especially when you present your work to them in good faith. In my opinion, everyone values feedback, the good and the bad. As Chapman wrote of the students who participated in her study, the first piece of writing and subsequent feedback was the first step towards gaining a sense of belonging to academia, the institution and the discipline. Some students who were studying creative writing discussed the importance of peer feedback specifically. We have to read our work out and we give feedback to each other. Some of the younger ones don't like reading their own stuff, they lack confidence. But I don't know why, some of them are really good. It can be quite intimidating. I don't want to sit there and slate someone. It brings out the diplomat in you. It's very useful. At first we were all so polite, not very useful at all. You'd think, okay, I know what's right with it, tell me what's wrong with it. It's hard to give feedback. I tend to point out strengths and weaknesses. The others just say, that was good, or I liked that character. You don't get much out of it. As you can see, everyone doubts their abilities. And even though some students can be afraid to give direct criticism, everyone wants to receive that feedback. Writers need diplomats, people who can be harsh and fair. There are so many writing circles online where you can get feedback on your work, whether it be through Discord, Reddit, writers forums, whatever. As I said, some people can be jerks, so use that crap detector of yours to separate the useful feedback from the unnecessary criticisms. It can be daunting to submit your work for review, no matter to whom you're submitting it, but that's all part of writing. You write forward, you don't look back, and you risk making a fool of yourself. For Bear, the two most important tools in combating imposter syndrome and similar feelings are time and collaboration. For the subjects in her study, collaboration opened their eyes to skills they weren't even altogether aware of before. As one participant said, I had never attempted to collaboratively write songs before. The truth is, I do find it very difficult creatively because I like to have control and I have strong opinions musically. But I think I was able to not be a jerk about it and compromise. I think I calibrated my ability with my expectations, as in, I lowered my expectations to match a realistic goal based on my own level of experience and technical skill. Although I know I have good musical sensibility, I do not practice very often, and my skills just grow very slowly over time. It felt good to see that I'm at the point where I can contribute in certain ways intuitively. As you give and receive feedback, your confidence will increase. And it's okay to be nervous about receiving criticism. Heck, it's okay to dislike whatever it is you're submitting. You don't always have to like the things you write. Think about it like this. The world's greatest mechanic probably knows a carburetor inside and out. Does that mean they love carburetors? Or do they hate carburetors? Taking writers' workshops in college was probably the best experience I ever had as a writer. Being able to receive direct feedback, edit my story drafts, and give feedback just as well helped me develop as a writer more than anything. The longer the workshop went on, the more belonging I felt. I cared less and less about the product and more and more about the production. Earlier, I mentioned how a work of art is never done, only abandoned. Well, there's another spin on that quote. Bill Condon is credited as saying, no piece of writing is ever finished, it's just due. As I said, you can't perfect your story, but what you can do is share your story with an editor and they can help you make it as perfect as possible until they decide it's ready for publication. And hey, speaking of feedback, I'm offering some for free. If you didn't hear, I'm going to be streaming, reading, reacting to, and reviewing user submitted content. You can submit your own pieces, or if you're curious as to what I think about some of your favorite authors, you can submit their work too. Poems, song lyrics, short stories, chapters from novels, submit it all. The link to submit your work is down below. Ultimately, I'd like to close out on some words from Neil Gaiman in his book, Instructions. Remember your name. Do not lose hope. What you seek will be found. Trust ghosts. Trust those that you have helped. To help you in their turn. Trust dreams. 
trust your heart, and trust your story. Now, I'd love to hear from you. What are your strategies when imposter syndrome and inadequacy come knocking? What other problems do you face as a writer that you'd like to see me discuss? Please, tell me everything. And keep in mind, ultimately, this is a rough draft. Hey, some other important announcements. As I said, you can submit your work to me through the Google form in the description. I also have a P.O. box if you'd like to send me a book or a letter. I'll be reviewing work on stream and then posting the VODs to my VOD channel. If you enjoy seeing me analyze literature, please subscribe there if you haven't already. I also started a Patreon if you'd like to support me there and receive some fan benefits like community Discord access. Lastly, I'm on Instagram and Twitter now, so follow me there for channel updates and other insights. Thanks everyone.